Supporters of laissez-faire capitalism need to be aware of the linguistic sleight-of-hand attempts of collectivists, monopolists, and dedicated world socialists to confuse facts and ideological terms in the minds of the average individual. Let me use the following excerpt to illustrate my point. Quote, In what is widely accepted to be an increasingly interdependent global capitalist economy, the resurgence of nationalism poses an apparent contradiction. With its emphasis on social and cultural exclusion, and its ambition of delimiting the territorial and sovereign limits of political authority, nationalism, and, indeed, the nation-state would seem dysfunctional to the needs of international capital, end quote. E.J. Hobbsbaum, 1975. First of all, within the context of global economy, or global government, the term capitalist is a misnomer at best, and brazen deceit at worst. You see, if the international documents and treaties of the United Nations serve as any indication, the economic and private property restrictions they place upon the average individual are authoritarian and socialistic in the extreme. They would certainly prohibit the individual from freely engaging in entrepreneurial capitalist free enterprise while simultaneously protecting from unfair competition the small but entrenched coterie of pro-capitalist, which there is no such thing, global financial monopolists. I will not even attempt to address here the draconian restrictions these documents place upon freedom of thought, conscious speech, and association. For contrary to the clever insinuations of Keynesian economists, monopolism is not capitalism any more than nationalism is automatically the ideology of those demanding the conservation of distinct politically sovereign nation-states. Monopolism is the protective merger of certain corporations with the state, thereby restricting or eliminating competition and eliminating the free choice of individual consumers to determine who shall provide them with goods and services. Monopolism, you see, is a manifestation of status or globalist socialism. Monopolism is the very antithesis of free enterprise capitalism. And contrary to the equally deceptive insinuations regarding nationalism, those who would seek to preserve individual freedom and laissez-faire capitalism under a politically sovereign constitution and bill of rights designed to do just that are the true pro-freedom individualists. These heroes are frequently lambasted by the same press, academicians and economists who would deliberately confuse monopolism with capitalism. You see, constitutionalists, objectivists, libertarians, and other laissez-faire capitalists are incorrectly labeled nationalists, and nationalist anxious to redeem their vile ideologies with more virtuous associations do nothing to dispel the rumor. In fact, in the view of the true nationalist, the cure for international socialism is nothing more than fascistic, authoritarian, national socialism, usually racist, ethnocentric, tribalistic, and hierarchical, and bearing no resemblance whatsoever to libertarian concepts of limited government, individualism, and pure capitalism. It is slander in the extreme to associate those who plead for politically sovereign nation-states in the name of pro-individualist, pro-capitalist freedom with those who espouse one of the most evil 
pro-collectivist ideologies produced of political theorists, which is nationalism. Nationalism, ladies and gentlemen, accurately defined, does not encompass a patriotic devotion to pro-individualist, minimalist government or a free economy. Quite the contrary. Nationalism, or its complete appellation, National Socialism, is the ideology of ethnic collectivism and economic protectionism overlaid with authoritarian state control of industry, property, and persons. It is closely allied to fascism, for which it usually serves as a preliminary political base, and populism, populism, yes, populism, an equally socialist politic which often precedes it. That's why you had better be damn careful if you're messing around with populism and the populist party. Nationalism, like its political fellow, populism, is completely antithetical to capitalism. Nationalism, like its political fellow, populism, is completely antithetical to capitalism. You see, both Adolf Hitler and Benito Mussolini were nationalists. Both men nationalized industry, eliminated free market competition, and instituted economic protectionism. Thus, the belief in political national sovereignty in a pro-individualist, pro-capitalist state is to stand against the principles of national or global socialism. You see, such a state and its citizens will not gladly relinquish their protected freedoms to a globalist, mixed, read socialist economy, of international monopolism. In short, global economy? Sure, if it's capitalist. Global government? Never. Not on your life. International free trade is not, nor ever has been, the enemy of political sovereignty of nations. That is, of course, assuming such national governments actually protect personal and economic liberty. In fact, in such systems, the government does not restrict free trade of any kind, because the government in such systems does not interfere at all in the economic life of its citizenry. You see, this is the very meaning of laissez-faire. Therefore, the problem with GATT and NAFTA is twofold. The government of an economically free people has no business engineering the economic treaty of any kind. It is interference into the economic life of its people, which is redundant in view of already recognized constitutional freedoms to that effect. Individuals of any capitalist nation are assumed to be free as individuals to trade with any person or nation of their own choosing. Government-engineered trade tariffs represent an illicit attempt of government to assume an economic authority not granted by pro-individualist constitutions such as our own. Mandates such as these interfere in the economy and should never have been enacted in the first place. Such allegedly pro-capitalist treaties as GATT and NAFTA then represent nothing more than a curious political redundancy and an attempt at governmental economic engineering that would seem more nationalist in the socialist sense than capitalist. GATT and NAFTA would thus seem to bear closer examination. National legislation repealing such anti-capitalist tariffs. Why the need for an anti-tariff treaty? 
The answers, ladies and gentlemen, are found in the bodies of the GATT and NAFTA agreements themselves. The answers are the political boners slipped into these documents by the international political and economic monopolists establishing a politically empowered international economic court to whose arbitrary rules the citizens of GATT and NAFTA nations fall subject. And far from establishing free trade, they actually impose international regulations on trade and manufacture. Yet these socialistic economic restrictions are passed off by international monopolists as promoting global capitalism. <laughs> First, though we must ask by what authority were our constitutionally protected individual rights and liberties signed over to this unaccountable international court, by the anti-constitutional assumed emergency powers authority claimed and exercised by every United States president since Franklin Delano Roosevelt. You see, this provision has enabled the presidents to usurp the lawmaking power of the Congress to unaccountably sign treaties with foreign powers, such as the United Nations, and to sign away our individual liberties under the guise of promoting free trade that should already have been assumed. Such totalitarian practices are insupportable and intolerable in a nation of free individuals. Again, free trade should be assumed without need of treaty in a nation of free individuals. Doesn't that make sense? Economic barriers erected by any government represent a system already moving into collectivism and away from freedom. So let us get down to basics. Assuming all intentions to be virtuous, the true purpose of legitimate, separate, and politically sovereign nation-states is not to ethnically or racially divide people of the world, nor is it to imprison the inhabitants of any nation behind stone walls or barbed wire fences, nor is it to engineer or restrict economic activity in any manner. Such purposes are collectivist and philosophically insupportable. No. No, ladies and gentlemen, the only legitimate purpose of maintaining separate and sovereign nation-states is to politically protect the individual rights and freedoms of their geographical inhabitants and to prevent in the political arena what the Keynesians promote in the economic arena which is monopolism. It has only been by virtue of the existence of competing political entities that the people of the world have remained even marginally free. You see, such a balance of world political power has always provided something of a check to potential tyrants. The humiliation factor, not to mention the possibility of escape or lawful immigration of one's subjects to a distant shore has often, though not always, served to curb the bloodthirstiest instincts of many a would-be dictator. And in that case, whatever in the world would be a sensible inducement for the citizens of a free nation to trade their national governmental system of pro-individualist and capitalist protections for the dubious governmental protections of a pro-collectivist, anti-capitalist global system. Folks, it is just too ridiculous to even consider. To label those supporters of political sovereignty as nationalists, thus virtually classifying them as totalitarian socialists, is to expose in all its resplendent human-hating evil, the actual agenda of the global political monopolists who seek to confuse us. You see, language is what enables us to apprehend and comprehend reality itself. 
Therefore, whosoever can successfully obfuscate or alter the meaning of political and economic terms in the minds of the world's inhabitants can equally well redirect and control our very ideas. Ayn Rand, the great objectivist philosopher, correctly identified yet another semantic obfuscation that has corrupted the cleanliness of political debate. And I quote, From the Intellectual Bankruptcy of Our Age by Ayn Rand, copyright 1961. But what is significant, ominously significant, is the fact that certain groups are now attempting to switch the term conservative back to its 19th century meaning, to palm it off in the public by imperceptible degrees, never bringing the issue fully into the open, hoping that people will gradually come to believe that a conservative is an advocate of authority, but of traditional authority. If semantic corruption becomes accepted on that wide a scale, if the political switch pulled on us becomes a choice between 20th century status liberals and 19th century status conservatives, what political system will be silently obliterated by that switch? What political system is being destroyed by stealth without letting people discover that it is being destroyed? Capitalism. End quote. And now that these anti-capitalist elitists have removed our linguistic and philosophical ability to debate their twisted ideologies, now that they have exerted political pressure on the world's legislatures to all but outlaw entrepreneurial capitalist activities, they would yet seek to further consolidate their political power, leaving the genuine pro-capitalist dissidents with nowhere in the entire world to run. Truly, collectivism has served them well. Such political monopolism is the most ominous threat to capitalism, indeed to any advocacy of personal freedom. International government, the embodiment of political monopolism, is a virtual guarantee of totalitarian control of the world's people and complete eradication of pro-individualist, pro-reason, ethics, and politics. The sole moral justification for any system of government is strictly the protection of the unalienable natural freedoms and individual rights of each and every person subject to its laws. 